championship is the lead data scientist and uh, one of the founders of the Sabra Geography Research Institute International. He also organizes the Tampa Bay Science Group and is its and is an avid supporter of STEAM and hacker related education. Please uh, join me in welcoming Joe Blankenship. <laughs> Thank you all so much for showing up. Um, like I said, if you want to know anything about me, just go to my website. I'm currently doing, I'm currently working on some credit research as well, so I'll be pushing that document on my presentation subtitle on my call. So it's also watching. Um, also, um, I can't see the here, but um, he's also the uh, he's set up a uh, project that's working with hyper related, so I was hoping to bring it for. Premier for more of the technical aspects and more of the technical questions you might have. But I'll try to get a little bit of that. So, as we said today, um, we'll be talking about blockchains and securities. Um, I generally do blockchain research from. Uh, Let's go over some basic stuff because even almost a decade on, there's still a lot of conjecture about what blockchains are, the use of them. Most people think Bitcoin, they think blockchains, but almost instantly when Bitcoin was Priest's first entity block in 2009, there's almost, there almost immediate bifurcation in terms of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain technologies that are now used for any number of things. Can you hear me, can you hear me okay? That? Sorry. I'll try to do a big point voice. Um, so I'm just going to go over some basic introductory blockchain terms, um, and then also go into some of the key players inside of the blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency industry, just so you're kind of familiar with names and technology, stuff like that. Um, and then we'll kind of go into the more ethereal, where the technologies are going, because um, Bitcoin's been around since 2008, 2009. But a lot of the newer blockchain technologies like Ethereum, Hyperledger, these things have only been around for a couple of years. And they're still rapidly evolving. They still have a lot of potential in terms of where they could go, but there's nothing been formally established in terms of what these should and should not be used for, which in terms of security is a, is a major issue because they're being developed without any kind of consideration as to what happens to the data that goes on them, how these systems integrate with the existing infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And then we'll, I'll leave the bulk of this for questions at the end, because I'm sure there'll be multiple questions regarding this and what I can actually talk to and work on it. So. so I'm extremely sorry for the size of this. <laughs> um, I was hoping that we'd have a bigger screen. Um, so blockchain. Um, a blockchain is it's one of the three core components to the initial blockchain framework. So a blockchain is just a series of, uh, series of blocks that are inside of essentially a distributed database system. Um, a miner is the second component in blockchain framework. Um, a miner or a, a distributed computer node is one of the elements that essentially establishes consensus amongst the entire distributed network. So you have blockchains, you have distributed nodes inside of this distributed network, and then you have cryptographic key structures, which is the third component that constitutes this framework. So all transactions on the network are signed by cryptographic key signatures or key pair. Um, the blocks are essentially collections of these transactions that are then looked at in terms of Bitcoin every 10 minutes to determine whose block is going to get pushed onto the blockchain. Once the miner cracks the hash, so essentially using proof of work, they will say, yes, I've got a solution, and as long as they're the only person that has a solution, another node will verify that it is a good block, and then we push on the blockchain, and they'll be rewarded for that. Um, so in terms of cryptocurrency, <laughs> cryptocurrency is the thing that's produced, um, a Bitcoin, Ether, um, Zcash, and Monero, these things. So these are all token values that are manifested because of the proof of work mining that goes on. Um, however, there's now a competing proof um, concept that's a mechanism called proof of stake, 
Um, the one that's getting the most known writings right now is Ethereum's Casper protocol. However, everything from ZSNARK to other different types of algorithms are being tested now to see whether or not proof of stake can actually be implemented without being easily hacked based on the person's holdings. Um, and we'll go a little bit more into the uh, proof of work versus proof of stake in the actual uh, later on in the presentation. So crypto finance, when you hear crypto finance, it's just financial transactions that are guaranteed by strong cryptography. Um, what the answer to currency is essentially just the token value produced by a system to incentivize mining and increasing the distributed network for a more robust consensus mechanism. Um, a wallet, when you hear a wallet, um, it can be on a phone, it can be on your computer, it can be a paper wallet. But essentially, it's, it's the uh, public private key pair that you use to identify yourself on the network. So whenever you sign a transaction, you have a public key, you sign it with your, your private key and the other person's public key identifies the sender or the receiver of the, the transaction. Smart contracts are some of the newer protocols. So we went over the, the blockchain, cryptographic key set structures, and miners inside of the distributed network. Those three core components are now being placed underneath a Turing complete language. Um, Ethereum uses Solidity. Um, but there are other um, protocols and consortiums that are putting um, now DAOs, DAOs and DACs can be programmed to be changed later if you so desire. Um, generally, when you're given the, the, the language, you're allowed to program these DAOs and DACs however you want. And as we saw with the DAO hack in August of 2016, um, these DAOs still have a lot of long ways to go in terms of actually producing a secure proof of, proof of concept. Um, there's still a long way to go. Okay, so how blockchain works, and we're going to talk about this. So let's say Alice wants to send five bitcoins to Bob. She'll sign off on this transaction for five bitcoins, and it'll go into a transaction pool. Now, like I said, bitcoin works on a 10-minute window. It produces a hash that every, every miner has to solve, and, and the difficulty of the hash is set so that it takes roughly 10 minutes to solve that, based on the previous computational power proofs that were produced before that. Um, so they try to balance and make sure the windows quite quickly have an average attendance. So the miners, Mike, Mel, and Mark, will compete and compile these transactions into a block, and they'll compete to see whose block gets put onto the blockchain. Once Mike produces a solution to the hash, cracks it, he'll submit that to the network for, for verification, and any node inside the network can verify it. So as soon as one node verifies it, yes, he produces the proper hash, it's below a certain value called the nonce. Um, he'll be rewarded with a certain block, a certain amount of bitcoin. So in this case, now it's 12.5 bitcoins plus the transaction fees for that block. Then that block gets put onto the blockchain, and then Bob, after that block is published, can then see the balance with the additional five bitcoins. Um, okay, so just in terms of basic things you should understand. Um, Proof of work, most of the systems now use proof of work. And all that, that proof of work is based on the robustness and the utility of SHA encryption. So right now, SHA-256 is what they use to sign off and encapsulate most of these transactions. However, Merkle tree structures or hash tree structures are becoming increasingly important in terms of how data is put into blocks and how the transactions are formed for processing inside these systems. Um, Bitcoin just did a... Uh, just added the uh, segregated witness protocol to the, to the uh, larger Bitcoin system. So that's been contested, and then there's also the Bitcoin Unlimited, that's kind of being sort of a larger bear, um, who's trying to promote a unlimited blockchain size and scale of the block. So the more transactions can be processed in a short period of time. Um, and inside of Ethereum, Ethereum uses Patricia trees, which is a variant of hash tree structures. Um, but in terms of just piling data into the blockchains and making sure that we can put as much stuff on them as possible, as fast as possible, um, they're becoming increasingly important and you're seeing more and more variants of those and different applications of those as time goes on. Um, search I focus most on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and look at those ecosystems. Um, for instance, some people focus on some of the consortium-based systems like Hyperledger. Um, privacy algorithms, there's a ton of them. Um, the one that I found was really interesting was the MIT Global Enigma for maintaining health records. Um, it seemed to have a really interesting uh, 
interesting combination of proof of work and different um, registry structures to store data and to make it better, faster, make sure it's more robust in terms of security. Um, so there are tons of other privacy algorithms, um, Zcash, Canero, these other protocols use obfuscation and different algorithms for making sure the transactions can't be identified. <coughs> In terms of consensus and government al governance algorithms, um, I think Bitcoin, Ethereum, but there are so many others. So there's, there's many different Bitcoin or altcoins and different uh, platforms are out there. They all have their unique protocols. Um, some don't even have proper blockchain elements as we know them now, like over transactions um, that use the client server architecture. Soon, and also methodology notifications. Like I said, in less than a decade, these technologies have been deployed and promoted and paid millions of dollars by different organizations to just have proof of concept as to what they can do. So if you can think of how these things can be used to provide security, privacy, data storage, stuff like that, the methodological applications are still wide open. There's a bunch of projects I'll talk to at the end of this that are working on all those areas. Um, but I think in terms of cybersecurity and InfoSec, I think that data storage is probably going to be your, your main focus. I mean, a lot of things in terms of what DTCC is doing with their security um, blockchain projects. What Wall Street's looking at is they're looking at trying to make sure that what they do is encapsulated and stored in a mutable data store to where there's a permanent record that can be easily audited and looked back at and analyzed for future use. So, key players, um, Bitcoin, once again, in 2008, there was a white paper published by the um, pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, once again, volunteer network for transferring Bitcoins based on proof of work, which is computational power. So, the, as much GPU, CPU power that you can throw towards mining on this network, the more influence you have over how, this, how this, the framework is governed, and essentially how blocks are published, and whether or not transactions can be also, the repeal is they reach 51%. Um, maximum of Bitcoin has a maximum number of Bitcoins that can be produced at 21 million. And currently, there are 16.1 million in circulation today. But because of the size and the complex of mining pools, especially within China, getting on here and just starting mining yourself is a very expensive investment to get involved with. And you have to meet um, a very high level of computational power to compete in terms of mining. Um, you can join mining pools, but that's another talk for another time. That's a very complicated matter. Um, transactions occur directly between two people, so it was meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. However, with the introduction of exchanges like um, Poloniex and Coinbase, things like that, you can now we now have middlemen in what's supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer network. So there's complications there. As well. and, most hacks that have gone on have been targeted at exchanges in terms of either stealing their keys or actually going towards the actual wallets themselves. So, once again, calculation there. Um, all the town challenges, transactions are public. Yeah. Anybody can go on and look at the Bitcoin blockchain and download it and analyze it. There's tons of tools out there to do that. Yeah. It's really nice in terms of data science. Um, transactions take about every 10 minutes. And like I said, the system adjusts its hash challenge, the nonce, to make sure that 10 minute window is kind of a tank. Now, the newer blockchain 2.0 systems, and Ethereum likes to promote this idea that it's part of the web 3.0 um, movement, kind of, but it's blockchain 2.0, which means that instead of having the set schema that Bitcoin has for its blockchain, Ethereum leaves the schema open on the blockchain so that you can publish contracts to it. Um, first, um, conceptualized by the call of Uterin in 2013, um, <coughs> Um, it's, it's, it's promoted as this idea of distributed compute power. So every node inside the Ethereum network is essentially part of a large world computer, um, which processes smart contracts, DAOs. So the smart contracts can take form of anything from you can create your own token currency, so you can recreate Bitcoin on Ethereum. You can create crowd sales. You can even build your own DAOs. Um, Liquid Democracy is the example to give you when you're first setting up. But you can build any type of DAO that you want. But most EAs up to this point have been used for crowd sales or additional coin options. Um, um, once again, Ethereum doesn't have a, a cap on, on what they produce. Currently, there's 88.6 million Ether on the market. Um, and once again, it's a one minute window. Um, they can do 15 second confirmations, but usually every block is published one minute at a time. Um, 
wanted to have you talk about here in a minute the uh, August 2016 um, DAO hack that occurred on Ethereum. Resulted in, any, I've heard anywhere from 50 million to 125 million US dollars equivalent of Ether was stolen during this hack um, using, a, uh, using a replay of the hack. So, very, very interesting. Um, the social stuff that erupted around that was also very interesting as well. But that resulted in a hard fork that resulted in the Ethereum and Ethereum Classic connections. Um, Ethereum Classic is kind of in flux right now because of uh, white hat hacker groups and a bunch of other stuff that's going on. But if you want to understand more about Ethereum Classic, um, their GitHub.io website is a great place to have a timeline on there that shows exactly what happened in terms of the hard fork and we'll up to it. So pretty different people forensics timeline. Um, Hyperledger is a, it's one of the four big consortium uh, blockchain groups. You know, I'll, I'll show you the board here in a minute. Um, once again, it's a, it's a multi-industry collaboration um, started in 2015 by the Linux Foundation. Um, uh, John Malike and it's uh, in Texas. Um, collaborators include every major financial, I wouldn't say every, but quite a bit. A lot of people that left R3 joined the Hyperledger project afterwards. Um, mainly because the Linux Foundation is the ones that are kind of supporting the effort. Um, the idea was to establish private permission blockchains. Now, the difference between a public and a permission blockchain is that it would be distributed, but only within the infrastructure of the company, which really isn't a true distributed. It's so centralized within the company infrastructure, so it's not really distributed. It's more of a distributed, centralized hybrid. Um, but my understanding in terms of the market spin now is that they're moving away from this model of deployment. They're now looking towards heavy encryption but public distribution. Um, so Intel, um, their, their uh, project is called Sawtooth that kind of looks at IoT mobile sensors. So blockchain and IoT is another big thing in 2017 and up until 2020. That's going to be a really, really important area of uh, development and, uh, and investment. Um, IBM's blockchain project is called Fabric, I'm going to mention that. And uh, also, this is pretty good as well. It's, in terms of the time of conception to the actual developer toolkits and developer uh, documentation, it was much faster than Ethereum was in terms of getting all that together. Even though Ethereum is very, very good now. They have a really good, really good list of tools and developer documentation to go over. Um, Open Transactions is kind of a unique case. Um, it's kind of where Chris Williams started out um, in terms of getting involved in blockchain technologies. It doesn't use a typical um, blockchain instead in, in terms of just distributed network, mining, cryptic signature, put in a block, or a blockchain. This uses a client server architecture where no blockchain and no transaction history occur. You know, if you want the option of storing a transaction history, it only stores, stores a certain number of them. But that's, a solid, that's established within the protocol that you establish for the contract that you put out there on the transaction. Um, you can build an official cash, smart contracts, um, smart properties, whatever you want in this protocol. And it's kind of a different framework. Um, but um, as far as I know, there's no any major projects that are built with it. It's just one of those notable side things, kind of like IPFS. You know, IPFS it layers good on top of blockchain, but it's not really a blockchain thing itself. Um, mobile clients, this will last as uh, temporary tokens. So. A lot of conceptual stuff that went on here, but it was one of those projects that still has a lot of potential to framework. It just there's no way to project that evolved out of it. Um, some other key players, um, Namecoin um, 2011 was a uh, censorship resistant DNS. That was a variant of the blockchain protocol or Bitcoin protocol. Litecoin is kind of like the silver Bitcoin's gold. Um, it's just another all points in Bitcoin. Ripple is an interesting thing. It's near free PayPal or PayPal esque service. Um, Dubai has actually integrated this into their national banking system as of this year. So something to definitely watch in terms of how Ripple evolves as a project based on that investment. Dash and Monero are anonymous in some transactions along with Zcash. Zcash is the kind of the pillow block in terms of uh, that type of service. Um, the, I think most of those use some variant of the Z-Snark algorithm to obfuscate who sends and who receives things on the network but still be able to retrieve that transaction based on that key pair that initially established the initial transaction. Um, also, for those of us who remember Boink, um, that was working on the city project, there are coin projects that kind of do the same thing in terms of medical research. So CureCoin, GridCoin, CoinCoin, these are all gears, these are all altcoins or cryptocurrencies that are used to fund and kind of incentivize scientific research. Um, 
Steam, Snero, and now Akasha is kind of the new one um, in terms of social media platforms, where Steam is kind of interesting because they use a, uh, a hybridized proof of work, proof of stake, um, and how they maintain records and incentivize people to contribute to the platform. Um, however, the white paper is one of the longest and most dubious ones I've read in terms of blockchain implementations. Um, so that, that's out there as well. And then MainState, MainState is one example of contributing data um, storage and web apps platform. However, there, there are a lot of other ones out there in terms of that storage. Um, IPFS is kind of the ones that are really pop. So, um, Magoo.github.io had a really good breakdown of root causes and estimates of hacks and number of hacks um, over the last three, four years. Um, so out of the 42 incidents, um, the vast majority of hacks against these platforms have been server regions, whether those servers are cloud-based or hard-based infrastructure within the uh, startup. Um, hack vulnerabilities, now the app vulnerabilities when you read through the reports, they go anywhere from having an Apple installed app on your system to having a web app or app plugin for your browser. So all those kind of constitute those kind of vulnerabilities. Um, a good chunk, but not too many, were insider threats. But I had a feeling that a lot of those other hacks had an element of insider threat to them in terms of either wall compromise, whether they were hot or cold storage, um, whether or not someone got spearfished, etc. So, but only the two of the 42 were noted as directly insider threats, like they maliciously took their information and exploited the system to extract. So, um, whether it's Bitcoin, or other, other cryptocurrency holders. Um, cloud account takeovers. Um, so, so a lot of these hacks, when they're when these systems are deployed on cloud-based infrastructure, um, a lot of attackers either gained access to administrative rights or the uh, permissions or the certificates to get into those infrastructures, and they would either do a direct attack on the system or they would set themselves up as a man in the middle to then duplicate transactions while the transactions were going on to funnel off of those those transactions into their own wallet. Um, and the vast majority of these things, the companies like Shapeshift and even the more popular ones like Ethereum, they didn't release all the details on how the hacks occurred. So a vast majority of these things are kind of, they come and release like, yeah, we got hacked, we were able to recover, we didn't recover. Um, a lot of the exchanges that got hacked, they had to declare bankruptcy, so. And then other ones are protocol related. So I would argue that the DAO, the, the Ethereum DAO hack, um, was more so a protocol related hack than anything else. Because the way the DAO was programmed, it was set up that you, it was set up so that you could submit transactions in such a way that you could <coughs> ask for them back within the time frame where they still went for the system. So you could actually go in there, keep on asking for more money and pull out the request before it actually got reported onto the chain. So I have a feeling that a lot of these systems have protocol related um, vulnerabilities, but they weren't the first ones that hackers found. So because a lot of these blockchain systems get implemented in certain use cases where the logic doesn't meet the capability of the protocol. So I have a feeling that as time goes along, I mean, Bitcoin has been through a ton of different soft and hard forms to come overcome several different hacks um, and vulnerabilities that have been <coughs> identified in the system. So then my argument for Bitcoin is that the only reason that it has lasted as long as it has in terms of viable cryptocurrency is that it, it's simple. <laughs> it's a simple use case. And people were really quick to identify vulnerabilities and patch them um, because this is a protocol. Um, now, what Bitcoin has done in terms of side chains, all coins, collect coins, meta coins, um, that expands the capabilities, but it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect the core functionality of Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is still going through the growing pains right now because of its complexity. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer to establish the baseline of here's how to set up a really solid smart contract. Here's a small DAO, a solid DAO. And you can do this without having so much risk. So here are some of the, the key attacks that you can go over. So because of the systems being based on proof of work, um, if anybody gains 51% of the computational power of the system, they technically have the ability to reverse transactions and affect the immutability of the system. So um, for anybody that follows Bitcoin news, um, Ghash um, is a mining pool that is, in 2014 was able to gain 51% of its compute power over Bitcoin, but they disbanded shortly thereafter. And the reason why I think they disbanded is not so much that they didn't want to exploit the power, it's because once you reach 51% compute capacity, the value of the currency disappears because it 
loses all its value based on its core tenets, which is immutability, trust, you know, the solid governance mechanism outside of human control. So for a hacker to gain 51% attack, gain that, that capability would mean that they would be defeating their own purpose of missing the hack, which is to extract value from the system. So, so in order to maintain the value they do have in the mining pool, they just went away. Split so on hundred different variables. But so recursive calling attack, that's what got the DAO and the Ethereum hack. You can sell sell short. <laughs> to what? You can sell short. Yeah, and and, and, well, and that's that's kind of the argument against these systems is that the, even though the systems software protocol wise are still robust, you can't remove the human factor in terms of manipulating from the outside how people interact with the system and ultimately. So stuff like manipulating exchanges, doing actual <coughs> finance based you know, manipulation of markets around this system. Yeah, those are gonna be persistent, you know, but how much of that can you program to account for inside the protocol? That's, that's still a question we're trying to answer inside of existing economic systems and existing political systems in terms of governance. So um, hot wallets are wallets that are stored online and can be seen online as active. Cold storage of keys or cold wallets are ones that are sort of offline or are, are not publicly available. However, both of those have been used as ter in terms of attack vectors to gain access to um, extract value from people's um, companies or wallets. Um, API vulnerabilities, um, your typical attack vectors to those. Uh, dependency backdoors. Um, so let's say you build a custom library. A lot of people use third party libraries. JavaScript was a big one that was exploited for a lot of these. Um, Sphere phishing, typical social engineering stuff. Um, embedded scripts, um, one attack in particular had a uh, Word document that had an embedded script in it, so when I put up their email, that attack was able to get access to or something like that. Um, admin servers, like I said, cloud infrastructure more so than locally stored servers. Um, people usually you know, use search certificate hacks and stuff like that to get in there and get people's credentials to that and manipulate how the migration and or um, operation of the system works. Most of those, in terms of cloud infrastructure, were attacked during migrations. They weren't attacked while they're, they're operating at capacity in their current state. Um, third party plugins, um, same dependencies. Um, so good old SQL injection, people have used that against the web app interfaces of the mobile app um, to get in. Um, and in the middle, like I said, they would, they would just get in there, duplicate transactions, and then put a lot of control of all, all the transactions. Um, DNS hijack, um, I don't know about that, someone credentials, I don't know about that. So, future of the blockchain. The key, one of the key components, one of the three core components of this protocol, decentralization and distribution. It's extremely useful in terms of keeping your data, you know, secure, but also keeping it available at all times. That's very appealing, but from the outside, as we just discussed, from the outside of these systems, there's a lot of politics and economics that go into how these systems get implemented and developed. And so in terms of how developers interact with investors and how these systems move forward, that is more determinant of what you might see in terms of security vulnerabilities moving forward, but also what use cases we might be looking towards in many of these things right now. Um, in terms of how we store data, how we um, secure transactions, how we increase privacy and security for communications like email. Um, also, corporations, governments formalize um, through data governance. Um, a lot of people that invest in these systems that are involved in developing or investing in these systems, they look at the governance mechanism and say, okay, well, if we have software regulate how the economic systems work, why do we need kind of political regulation around it? Can the software act as our governance mechanism? to make sure that we don't get ripped off. And there's a bunch of problems with that that we can't really, we don't have time to discuss here. But there are people that see that, see the governance, cryptographic key structure, and the blockchain being out there publicly as a way to say, listen, we don't need regulation, the system regulates itself. This isn't, you know, let us do our own thing over here. But you're saying there's too many flaws in that. Um, both, the, both, both from the inside and the outside, yeah. Um, and my, my thesis kind of expanded on that a little bit. Um, Sorry, I didn't um, Alternative economies, um, it kind of parallels with the decentralization and distribution in terms of government stuff. Um, middlemen and labor dynamics. Um, so there's two main things that DAOs and smart contracts have the ability to do. It has the ability to automate really basic functionality of people's jobs and labor tasks. So a smart contract can act as a notary. A smart contract can act 
as an intermediary to check if a transaction goes through. So stuff that might have been either checked by a person or done directly by a person can now be automated. Um, this means that instead of having a major type of employment, you have this externalized microemployment where if a machine can't handle it, you might have to go to a human to verify it, which will be done at a much lower cost. Instead, instead of having a full-time job, they would just task that person with onesie twosie and give them a token to say, hey, thanks for verifying this transaction. So there's a shift in labor dynamics as well, um, and also how both digital companies in terms of DAO and how physical companies nowadays will be structured based on how much they can automate using um, blockchain technologies. Um, also, personal currency is backed by personal value. So from coming from the, from the bottom up, people now have the ability to create their own tokens, <laughs> their own contracts, et cetera, et cetera. They can now start saying, hey, my personal currency can be backed by whatever capital commodity backing I have, whatever equity I have to put into this, I can now back my own currency. So that causes a whole bunch of different economic problems for a bunch of different reasons, especially because they're competing against fiat and national-based currencies, international-based currencies, and securities that already have established regulation and values put towards them. So what happens when these, these localized, grassroots, um, micro-scale micro economies start evolving on their own against those regulated economies that already exist? How do they match up if they want to find some kind of revolution? Um, patents and intellectual property, you know, a big thing with companies nowadays, especially startups, is that a startup can be brought up, sold, commodified because they have a certain patentable technology or some kind of intellectual property that you can use to leverage in the market to sell the company. And in fact, a large amount of companies, big corporate companies, Fortune 100, 500 companies, the vast amount of money they make is by protecting these, these properties, these ideas, and stuff like that, so they can sell them on the market as either trade secrets or directly on property. So what happens when people can not you know, go on there and create a smart contract to be a, a notary for their own ideas and then push that to the copyright or patent office? Well, that takes a huge chunk out of companies and what power they do have to either hire labor or to exploit their own labor they currently have to innovate further out of the office. They don't have to pay people directly for those innovations, which causes a whole bunch of different economic dynamics. Also class um, Speculation and investment. Um, like I said, I've seen, in terms of the exchanges for cryptocurrencies, I see roughly the same thing you would see on any different type of monetary exchange. You know, it's the, it's the same type of speculation, same type of, you know, um, investment type of um, methodologies, strategies. Um, but, but the thing about cryptocurrencies is that not every cryptocurrency is made the same or equal. Um, some of them have you know, anonymity built into their token value. Some of them have security or, certain, or transparency built into them, or some kind of complex functionality. And that makes these speculation and investment strategies both more diverse but also more risky. So how do people distribute the risk outside these networks and kind of leverage, I mean, how do you, how do you value Bitcoin against Ethereum, against Zcash, you know? You know, these are kind of fleeting things that we kind of do on the fly now based on very basic economic principles. But as the values in these systems grow and kind of evolve on their own, how these strategies evolve and how does stability or you know more risk in you know because Bitcoin still fluctuates from anywhere from eight hundred US dollars to now I think it's like one thousand one hundred yeah. a day. So I mean it fluctuates quite a bit, and that's that, that both attracts people and also makes people averse to looking at the systems as a real type of investment. Why, why does it fluctuate like that? Um, based on demand. And, and uh, okay. same kind of speculation that drives any kind of um, we'll, we'll go a bit more on the keyword. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, cryptocurrency versus fiat versus credit. Um, you have to keep in mind that, so inside of cryptocurrency communities, cryptocurrencies are not considered virtual currency. A virtual currency to most academics, most econ economists, is considered an imaginary currency, like you get on second life or some kind of video game. <laughs> However, to cryptocurrency people inside of cryptocurrency communities, these are tantamount to fiat credit digital currencies. So generally you have digital currency at the top, virtual currencies, and then cryptocurrency being a subtype of a virtual currency. The reason why people consider cryptocurrency not a virtual currency is because it both has exchangeability and fungibility as a currency. Um, whereas most virtual currencies generally do not, generally do not, have those two things. Now, there are cases where people have sold off virtual gold inside World of Warcraft and like that for real-world money, but that's not considered the same type of economic market that Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other virtual currencies or cryptocurrencies have. 
Um, also, ethical computation. You know, if we're building governance governance protocols to drive these cryptocurrencies, whether it's proof of work, proof of stake, you know, as a you know, encapsulating the cryptography structure, public blockchain, distributed network as a governance mechanism, what are the ethical considerations that have to go into the code as well to make sure that we're not creating new unevenness inside of economies, or we're actually not just recreating the same economy that we currently have, we're just shifting power to different class of people. Um, and, and that also has to do with accessibility to the general population as well. As of right now, it's really a U.S., Canada, you know, North America, Northern Hemisphere, Europe, U.S. kind of is where you see the highest concentration of these things being done. London specifically, like in 2017, London has probably the highest concentration of cryptocurrency and blockchain conferences out of any location in the world. And that's where a lot of people that I know that do a lot of the writing of these things are located at. Um, okay, so big names to look for. Um, the, the four big um, consortiums in terms, of, in terms of fintech um, are Wall Street, Hyperledger, the R3 Consortium, Blockchain Alliance, oh, and uh, P3I, so there's five I put up here. P3I is one I added last minute because they're kind of the new insurance kits on the block. They're trying to do what Quant's doing and a lot of people are trying to do in terms of putting insurance mechanisms and insurance companies on the blockchain, um, which I think is going to be very interesting in the coming years, um, especially looking at 21. Um, so data storage, record keeping, um, storage, main safe, protocol, and where main safe. Um, the storage is a kind of new project in order to, in fact, all these projects, they all utilize that Merkle tree hash tree structure I was talking about. They try to pack as much data into the Merkle tree as possible to store that in as small a space as possible, which means that they can both store a ton of data, um, distribute it, storage, and also make sure that it's redundant, protected, decrypted, and safe, not just when the path from A to B, but in the data source themselves. So um, in terms of voting, legislation, regulation, um, follow my vote um, is a blockchain-based voting company that they're just kind of building up right now. Um, two countries are moving. Estonia and Denmark have started implementing technologies from everything from their own currency, national currencies, to actually regulating how they vote inside their own legislative branch. So Denmark actually just started doing the implementation for monitoring and recording their legislative activity. Um, I should also mention for voting legislation regulation, that kind of parallels with the identity protection. Um, BitNation is kind of a movement from uh, Sweden, where they're trying to establish a world citizen type movement again, which is no, it's not real, it's not a, a, a recent idea, but it's one that they're trying to redo now on top of the blockchain. In fact, it's funny because you can actually go there and you can actually establish your own uh, BitNation uh, passport in like 10 minutes. So. Can't go anywhere with it, but you can make it. Um, social, social, uh, social media, social organization. Steam is probably the biggest one that most people know in terms of blockchain and social media platforms, but Akasha is one that Ethereum and IPFS are doing right now to uh, kind of redo Twitter. That's what it looks like now. It's out. And also, identity protection, Dash, Monero, Zcash, um, BitNation, CryptID, um, all these projects are meant for privacy, security, and being your information and making sure that only you can access it. Um, so, cool. Um, that's all I have. Um, I'm open to questions. And Chris, if you want to join me up here as well, um, I can answer technical stuff. Hey guys. Yeah. Uh, everybody, hey, hey, a couple people watching. Hey. This is Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we well, can find these slides online. Um, yeah, we're at. Um, on my GitHub. So if you go to djoblinkjit.com, um, you'll see a little GitHub icon. Click on that, and you'll see it on my blockchain presentation. Sorry, I probably couldn't keep the cubes in there, but I'll have the it, it's, it's cool, man. We're all like crazy busy. And we'll make sure you're okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, few quick questions. Uh, the the fork that happened in Bitcoin in 2012 and the fork hard fork that happened with Ethereum in 2016. Who does the forks and who makes that decision that we're going to fork it and make this mathematical correction? Okay, so whenever the, the developers want to institute a fork, they first redo the software framework that's stored as an open source project. In fact, most of these blockchain projects are open source projects. Oh, that's right. right. So, so there is a hierarchy of somebody, right? Yeah. So as soon as the developers institute those new changes inside the software framework, they have to have, a, a, they, have, they try to get everybody in the system to install the new software, which then 
institutes the new, the new form. If there's a, any kind of bifurcation or any number of people that don't want to install the new software to run the blockchain, then a hard fork occurs. So in a few cases, either 50, 50 plus 1 or 51% of the network, I know. But a certain, a certain critical mass of computational nodes have to agree that it's a new software. And with Ethereum Classic, so. And Ethereum Classic, they, they had a hard fork, right? Yeah, 2012. They had a hack and a hard fork. Yeah, almost all the network decided, hey, we're going to go into this new blockchain fork. This is going to be the main fork. Mm -hmm. However, the orphan branch still remains. Anybody can go on there, pick up that software version, and still mine that address. Mm -hmm. However, the currency you mine is not going to be worth anything because no one's going to trade you for that bit. They're going to want the main, main hard fork. Uh -huh. um, Ethereum, now, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic is a different story because. A critical mass of people decided they didn't want to adopt the new hard fork based on the hack that occurred. Uh -huh. So that critical mass moved over to a different variant of the software to then run Ethereum Classic. What's it called? Ethereum Classic? Yeah, Ethereum Classic. Yeah. What they do is just make some alterations to compensate for the yeah, vulnerability? Still, yeah, they're still using GAP, they're still using the... And so instead of going through a fork and redoing all this code and going to like a new version, that. Let's just fix the one we have, make some minor changes, and stick with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm overgeneralizing. I would say it's even more foundational than that. They said uh, we'll allow people to make this mistake again in the future. Yeah. <laughs> that was the difference between classic and new. They said, okay, you know, uh, with the hard fork, you know, that version of Ethereum is going to undo the mistake. Like put everybody on notice, we'll do it again. We'll, we'll, if somebody makes a big mistake, we'll do it again. But Classic said, you can make mistakes, blow up your world, it's fine with us. And that's, that's pretty profound. It's yeah, power. It's real power. <laughs> so, so what is that? I, know, I have an account on Coinbase, and I see Ethereum is available there. Which Ethereum is that? That's the, that's the main branch. The new branch? Yeah, so the one that the talk here and a lot of main developers supported. Uh -huh. The one that undid the hack. That's the one that's on the point. There's one, if I go, one that undid the hack, and, yes. and that's the new branch, right? The, yeah, that's the, the new, that's new the, it's not classic. That's the popular, the popular branch. That's right. And what do I get if I buy one Ethereum? What do I get? Do I get a section of contracts, or do I get that? Because there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no limitation on like Bitcoin. So what about inflation? What about that concept? Same thing applies. Huh? It's just, just more volatile. So when you buy one Ethereum from Coinbase, you're buying an Ethereum from their pool of investors. Uh -huh. that they're yeah. So you get a marker inside their system and then you hold it. Uh -huh. So if you go to etherscan.io, where it still shows that they own your ether, you just hold a marker with them. Uh -huh. Another way of saying you own one ether of their Okay, and I'm buying a section of contracts and a section of no. natural processes that are going on. You have a contract that you, so you hold some of their stuff. So you don't hold any contract, you just hold a marker inside of the contract that says you hold ether. Okay, and that fluctuates in value and everything like that. Yeah, so, yeah, based on basic demand of monetary supply. But there's, but there's a supply and demand component in this, even though so you said Ethereum's unlimited? It produces unlimited coins, yes. Uh -huh. but, yeah, so inflation will, yeah, so it's not deflationary. It will inflate fluctuate demand of the currency. Okay, I sold a Bitcoin, a few Bitcoins yesterday on the coin basis, and who got my, who got my fee? The guy who got my hash? Is it one guy that got the hash, or is it just the, the general the, public? The node that published the block got your transaction. The node? Yeah, like whatever gas you use. Whatever gas, gas is represented, representational and computational power inside of Ethereum. However much gas that you spent uh -huh. in your power to publish that transaction, yeah. the miner that published that block to the blockchain and got that transaction. You got that money from me, so just one guy, it's not the whole system. Just one yeah, guy. Yeah, it's right in this block. Okay. Okay. okay, and what's the best wallet? This is generally a basic question, but isn't um, a blockchain basically a linked list, or how is it different from a linked list? Um, okay, so the difference between a linked list and this is the, the, the protocol and the cryptography used to create that, that chain, that, that database. It's a database like any other database, it's just distributed with a protocol. But at its core, it's a linked list, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. Well, it's more complicated. Yeah, the, the idea of the concept at a very foundational level is something like that. How anonymous is tracking sort of Bitcoin ransomware? For example, the hospital um, whose data was encrypted and they uh, paid in Bitcoin to their ransom. How? So, so in terms of anonymity and obfuscation of Bitcoin, Bitcoin was kind of 
improperly labeled in the beginning as an anonymous currency, it's pseudonymous. Based, based on your transaction, your wallet, your address on Bitcoin, people can track back and come find out who you are based on that transaction and that history. So with Bitcoin, there's tooling, everything that's available, and you probably know more than I do about how they track Bitcoin. But it's, it's become quite point where, based on what you did, when you did it, what interactions, what history you have on the blockchain, they can determine who you are based on those transactions. So that was, I was curious, why is it such a desirable way of paying ransomware? as opposed to yeah. some other mechanism, if it's traceable. It's international, <coughs> and you can turn it into local currency anywhere in the world, yeah. wherever you got people deployed. Okay. So, you know, if you get a million dollars, it's super easy to trickle a little bit out over in Malaysia, a little bit in India, a little bit, you know, and collect it all up, you know, and I guess the, the black market or something. I mean, it gets the anonymity part, which is, I think, where he, he's trying to go. I get is one of the... Is it because, because I recently just set up a crypto wallet a couple of months ago, um, just to start learning about it and stuff like that. But, um, you know, you could put false name in there. You could put, you know, yeah. Michael yeah. Jordan and I live in Moscow. And, and, you know, so even though, to what you said, yeah, you could track it, but then you get it down to a person that doesn't exist. And because I can offload that money to some bank in Zimbabwe and just do a wire transfer someplace else, it's like, how far do you got to go to really find out who I really am? Well, and maybe even more close to home, uh, if you meet somebody at Starbucks that wants to buy Bitcoins here in Florida, and you exchange $20,000 for Bitcoins, that's not considered um, a money transfer. You don't have to pay money. Uh, uh, you don't have to register uh, as a money transfer agent. Yeah. So it, in Florida, as long as it's inside the, uh, the boundary of Florida, um, it's not regulated in any way, other than you're going to have to claim it you know, on your tax forms, you know, whatever profit you got. But that means that uh, the black market for now could have a very healthy operation <coughs> in Florida. And there's a couple other states that are real lenient on it right now. But some states do regulate it? Yeah, yeah. Really? Like, like in New York, or if you're um, usual suspect, yeah, California, yeah, yeah. New York. All right. Okay, nice. Oh, wow. He's answered the question. I did not know Bitcoin is regulated in some states. Right. right. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Sorry. You didn't. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the social aspect of it, uh, is it mostly to just uh, assure the the identity of the people that, that are part of the network? I just, I, it's not kind of hard for me to wrap my head around the social media aspect of YouTube blockchain. What, what's the use case of it? For social media? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So Steam is essentially it's, it's essentially a blockchain driven web. So if you if you post on there, instead of just having upvotes and downvotes for your your, your Reddit, you know identity and popularity and that, your your ultimate like uh, reputation, Steam will give you Steam coins based on if people upvote you, downvote you. Then because you're creating content that's useful to the entire network, they incentivize you to contribute more by giving you Steam coins based on how many upvotes you get per post on Steam. And then what can you do with those coins? Um, you can exchange them on any major exchange, um, Poliax, um, the other exchange. Okay. okay, okay, now I see the connecting tissue. Okay. Yeah, so, changes, so there's there's a financial uh, aspect to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, same thing with Kasha. Kasha gives you Ether for your votes, and you can exchange Ether on Poliax and my base for those dollars. Yeah, I was using that connection. Yes. Do you have a question? No, no. Okay, very much. In terms of uh, future quantum computing, does that have any effect on the actual protocol? Or is there going to have to be a hard fork, soft fork anywhere since it's, what, like SHA-256A? I would assume if you're going to build a blockchain application for quantum computing, you're going to want to start from the, the, the ground up. Because I don't, think, I don't know of any blockchain framework right now that can handle those considerations. They're still working on blockchain 1.0, 2.0 financial applications. So the world of Cryptocurrencies and blockchains is largely focused on how financial existing financial institutions can invent these technologies, how individuals can empower themselves by creating alternative economies. You know, 3.0 is the, the realm of new applications like different type of computes, different kind of storages, stuff like that. So in terms of quantum computing, I also say I, I looked at the D-Wave site a few like last week, and they're up to a 2,000 qubit computer. So you can buy a computer that has a quantum computer that does 2,000 bits in every cycle. But the problems that you solve with that have to be solvable by a quantum computer. There's some problems that aren't really given any advantage there. And so uh, cryptography, certain kinds of cryptography, are going to be 
killer casings for our quantum computers. Some other cryptography techniques aren't. And it's just because you have to string together all the qubits in such a way. You have to know their relationship ahead of time and then run your problem through it to have it solve it. So uh, we, we're certainly going to have to change. It's the big, biggest, scariest thing out there for all cryptography right now. Yeah, sure. Especially for Sean. Yeah. Well, well, on that point, uh, actually, SHA isn't at risk. It's actually the elliptic curve operation, so it's the, the private key stuff. But what you can do is, when they get to that point, if we have a quantum resistant signature algorithm, you can actually apply that to the current blockchain as a, as a transactional stamp, and then continue on using quantum resistant public key crypto from that point forward. So it won't require necessarily a hard fork, but it's going to be a race between is it broken first or do we have a replacement for that algorithm? So, so at that point you're just transferring your sponsor? No. So you're exchanging bitcoins at that point? At, at which time? Oh, never mind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying for people, people have questions for about 10 minutes, so yeah. we can always meet up afterwards in the hallway and just... To, uh, have you heard of big chain DD? Um, is that the SQL overhead for doing the type operation wrong? I'm not sure, but it was supposed to be using blockchains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, are they pushing the line? They're still in the belt right now. I think they're pushing the line.